Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. We're going to talk about bridging the gap between generations. You know, there's no age limit. It, that's the beautiful part. Uh, you, you, can, you can be any age and God can use you and work through you. And I think sometimes, well, well, we'll talk about it as we get into scripture, but it's beautiful to me that they can go up, be born again. These were three born again and then three others filled with the Holy Spirit. So six lives dramatically changed this morning in children's church. And so we want to be, we want to invest in the next generation in their in their lives in their spirituality and maturing them into the ministry they're laying hands on each other they're praying for each other up there some of us you know it was we were way older than that before that happened so i love seeing that don't you friend it's it's beautiful so tonight as we prepare i kind of feel like a teacher teaching the day before spring break <laughs> any any teachers in the house know what i'm talking about it's like, do I even teach tonight? Because they know the dessert auction is fixing to happen. So I appreciate your participation in praise and worship. You were there. So I feel like I can teach for a few minutes before class is dismissed and, and it all gets wild. But tonight as we go across to prepare for the youth mission trip, I believe the Lord wants us to understand the importance of our investing our time and our resources in the next generation. The world is pushing lies. And a friend of mine uh, from Missouri, we were talking about this, talking about how media, especially television, makes dads look stupid, makes old people look stupid, makes young people look not interested. They're selling a lie. Young people are interested in the truth. They are interested in having good lives. Old people are so interesting, it's ridiculous. Put me in a room with an old, because I'm not old yet. I'm not even middle-aged yet. I'm not even 60 yet. So, you know, put, put us in a room with, with that wise generation. And can't you just sit and listen and just keep your mouth shut? Because this is not the time for a young person to talk. We need to be sitting there listening. And yet social media and television, music, all the different genres that the enemy uses are, are trying to paint a different picture to us that is not scriptural. And, and we've got to make sure that we don't separate the generations in the church. We don't separate the generations in the word. Um, we're not too different. And they do want to listen. And we are relevant. And they are not ignorant. There is so much value in every generation. God is truly in every generation. And I, I love what the girl shared with us this morning, because that, or what happened this morning, because that just really shows it. The truth bridges the gap. The word is timeless, folks. It, it was... It was valid for Methuselah. It was valid for Moses, for Noah, for Abraham, for Jacob, for Isaac, for David, for Rahab. It was valid for every single generation. Paul, the disciples, the apostles, the people that are sitting on the pews today, a lot of us are reading the same words that God spoke to Abraham. They're still valid. That's amazing. You can't find a truth that is more settled than God's word. And so when we start talking about generations, and sometimes we study the generations when we go to ministry team meetings and ministers meetings, and we talk about what's in the next generation, the tendencies that are in the next generation, we have to be really cautious that we don't separate them from ourselves because the truth is the same from generation to generation. It doesn't change. Our lighting might change. The color of our carpet might change. The pastor's hairstyle might change. Men may not wear suits. They may have their shirts untucked when they're preaching, Mark, instead of a suit and tie. But the truth, 
The truth is that common thread that runs generation to generation, so we can't fall for the lie that the world's trying to pass on to us. And as I began to study scripture today and look at the scriptures that contain the word generation or generations, we're not going to cover them tonight because there are too many. It, this is an important subject to the Father. So let's go to Psalm 71, and I'm just going to take you to a few scriptures, and then you can study out the rest. I love these scriptures. Listen to what the psalmist says here. Psalm 71, 17. O oh God, you have been my teacher from the time when I was young, and I have been talking of your works of wonder even till now. Man, maybe I don't like this part. Now when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, give me not up. He, he says, don't let me die. Don't let me out of here yet. Till I have made clear your strength to this generation and your power to all those to come. This was so important to him. Don't let me leave this place until I have made known your strength to this generation and your power to all those that come. Now listen to what Barnes' commentary said. He said he had lived to speak to a new generation. And he was desirous that they should start on the journey of life with the advantage of his experience. As of one that had gone before, each generation may thus enter on life with all the accumulated wisdom of the past. That is, as wise as those had become who had themselves had the experience and treasured up results from the observations of a long life, society thus makes progress. And when I read that today, I thought, this is how society makes progress. And what I've seen in our society has not been progress. And I thought of the word degeneration. I thought, what an interesting word. Degeneration takes away progress. When you start separating the generations and the generations quit engaging, and they quit associating, and they quit corresponding with each other and talking with each other about life, which is what the world's trying to do, is separate the generations. Then, then we stop progress and we start degenerating. Interesting thought. He says, one generation becomes wiser and better than the one which went before it, and the experience of all ages thus accumulates as the world advances, enabling a future age to act on the results of all the wisdom of the past. So what happens if we quit talking? And what happens if we quit engaging with the next generation? The wisdom's not past, Carl. You're a wealth of wisdom, sir. Isn't he, Nelda? It's a wealth of wisdom. So the next generation is missing what we learned if we do not engage with them. That's huge. We can't let it happen in the church. If you looked up on the platform this morning, I was trying to remember who all was up here this morning. My praisers may have to help me. I remember Tina was up there, Lisa was up there, April, okay, I was, I was hoping April was up there because you're 30-something, right? So we had, I'm not going to point to who was in their 50s. <laughs> Back here, we had, right, 50s? 50, okay, that's 50s. That's 50 plus some days. You qualify. I, did, I missed you at Generations last night, by the way. Um, <laughs> we had 50s. We had 40s. We had 30s, we had Anna 20s, we had Jason teens, and Jordan. Jordan's in which age group? 30s. Dylan, 20s. That's beautiful to me. Well, why are we putting all those young people up there? Because we're investing. Not only are we investing in them for the future, but they are inspiring us. They, their generation has something that our generation does not. Our generation has something that their generation does not. Why do we have the old people up there? Uh, 
because they have something that the young generation does not. So here comes this beautiful body of Christ blended together, feeding each other what, you, what each other needs. Truly, we learn from the older generation, and truly we learn and are inspired by the younger generation. This is, this is God's plan. That was so beautiful to me. Right now, young adults are in the next building. College-age kids are in the next building right now teaching 6th and 7th graders praise and worship music on instruments, helping them to find their gifts and their talents. Right now, next door, the youth are preparing to treat you, I know I shouldn't bring this up, to a dessert auction. And then you are going to go over there and invest in their ministry. Right now, you may be sitting on the pew next to a five-year-old or an eight-year-old or a ten-year-old. This is good. You want to know why we don't have something for the kids at every service? Because we need them beside us. And when you're up here leading praise and worship and all the old people are kind of grumpy looking when you look out and they kind of sound and kind of, you know, like they've had a hard day and then there's that, that eight-year-old that's belting out praise like there's nothing else in the world. And then you go, oh, yeah, yeah. It's a great balance. We need them on the pews. Oh, if they make a little noise, it's okay. It's all right. Because we need them out here. And they need to sit by you. They need to see you taking notes. They need to see you studying the Word. They need to, to see you in prayer and in praise. And this is building the body of Christ, building the church for generations. So don't pass young people by. Don't pass them by. Don't just walk past them. And don't pass old people by. Because every generation has something to give. Psalm 78. I'm going to read a little bit here. I'm going to read seven verses, so bear with me. Starting with verse 1. I'm reading out the Amplified. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching, and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, in instruction by numerous examples. I will utter dark sayings of old that hide important truths, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, but we will tell to the generation to come the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonderful works that he has performed. For he established a testimony and expressed precept in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel commanding our fathers that they should make the great facts of God's dealings with Israel known to their children. That the generation to come might know them, that the children still to be born might arise and recount them to their children. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but might keep his commandments. What's going to keep them from forgetting? What's going to keep them from not knowing? You. Not just this generation, but I love that it says that the children still to be born. Thank you. That's why we need them out here. They listen. You. You talking about the wonderful works of God. That's how they're going to know. That's how they're going to know his commandments is us passing them down. Every, inter every generation tries to improve upon the last generation. Now, our, our trouble has been that sometimes when, when we've seen one generation do something that we, we thought was wrong, we swung the pendulum too far. And we bring this radical change. I don't really know what happened from the 50s to the 60s, but something. Okay? Something bad went wrong. And they thought, oh, this beaver cleaver uh, family thing is, you know, that's really restrictive. A woman staying at home and, you know, looking all pretty in her little dress and baking cookies and taking care of children. And so they, they swung the pendulum the wrong way and we had the women's rights movement. And then things just went nuts. So every generation thinks they're going to approve upon the last generation, but we need to be real careful that we don't lose the wisdom of the last generation when we're making our improvements. That's not an improvement when we lose the wisdom of the last generation. And that's what the world has been tempted to do and tried to do 
That's not what the church is to do. We're to take the wisdom of the last generation. I truly believe every generation in the church should be an improved generation. We should know more. We should have more wisdom. And I believe praise and worship changes in that way. I think it should change. I think it should get closer to heaven every time with every generation. And if we look at it right, don't criticize the generation above you. Don't criticize the church generation above you. I've been guilty of it myself. Take what they knew because they were an improvement on the generation before. And see it that way. Take what they knew and then learn more and, and have respect and hold on to the wisdom and keep pride out. Because thinking we know more can, can be an issue. Keep us from learning. 1 Timothy 4. Most of you are familiar with this one. I heard Dylan, by the way, speaking of next generation, I heard Dylan did an excellent job last week. And Bob, y'all were in good hands, taught the word. And while I was gone, that's great. The scripture made me think of them, although Bob's not that young anymore. He was young when we first got him, wasn't he? I look back at the pictures, he was just a baby. He's matured. He's seasoned. A little gray. 1 Timothy 4. I'm thankful for them both. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. And do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid hands on you. And be diligent in these matters and give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, this is great because when younger generations come on behind us, and, and I honestly believe anybody who has uh, any leadership should be looking for their Joshua. I believe they should be looking for the next generation. And I don't think we need to appoint that generation. I think God will, God will show us who they are. Probably it will be the person that's already doing doing what needs to be done and doing helping you and that sort of thing so always be aware that somebody is going to come on behind you and you want them to be better than you if you love the Lord and you love the kingdom or you love your job if it's on your job you need to want the next generation to be better than you if you're up here on the platform and you're leading praise and worship you better hope that these young girls are knocking it out and don't let jealousy enter in. When Dylan's up here and I come back and everybody's, oh, Dylan, oh, Dylan, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know what I know? The next generation's going to hear the word. He's out there preaching. Well, he's not preaching tonight. He's getting your, you know, what desserts ready. And, but he's out there bringing up youth to know the word of faith, to know how to cope in, in a generation that doesn't know how to cope, they're going to know how to cope by the Word of God. And you, we can't afford to get jealous. God's doing something in every generation. We just get to sow into it and be a part, and we can't look down and despise their youth. Oh, they're young. Oh, they're just young. They'll learn. Oh, yeah, they'll learn. That can be a good thing if you pass on your wisdom instead of just letting, watching them fall. We've got to be engaged. We've got to interact with the next generation because God has a plan for it. Pay attention to the coming generations. Sow into them and listen to them. Joel 2, the prophets speaking, is also repeated in the New Testament when they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. But I love Joel 2 because he said, verse 28 says, And afterward, I'll pour out my spirit on all people, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men, they'll dream dreams. And your young men, they'll see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on, in those days. Woo! Let your kids listen to them. Listen to them. Sometimes they can be more sensitive and see and hear things from God that we miss because of the callous, because we have lived life. 
Sometimes we get a little callous. Those kids, they're fresh. Their hearts are fresh. Their hearts are open. They haven't shut and built walls yet. So when they say something, we need to pay attention because God can use them to speak into our lives. There is no age on truth. There is no age limit on who God can speak through and who he can use. The truth fits all generations. Amen? 1 John chapter 2. Got two more scriptures to go, guys, if you guys want to give them the warning. They will come out of here like a herd. 1 John 2, verse 13. Here I'm reading out of the Amplified. Verse 13. He says, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you have come to know recognize, be aware of, and understand him who has existed from the beginning. So there he's writing to the fathers. And he said, I'm writing to you because you know, you recognize, you're aware of, and you understand. You understand some things. You've lived through some things. You've applied some things. You understand him who existed from the beginning. And I'm writing to you, young men, because you have been victorious over the, vic over the wicked one. And I write to you, boys, or lads, because you have come to know, recognize, and be aware of the Father. You see the, how there's something in every generation there that he felt the need to speak to? This is where the church needs to be. Every generation has a place with God. And, and every generation has the heart of God. He's for them. And, and he's working in them. and He has plans for them. And it doesn't matter if you're 99. My goodness, your history. Your history is valuable to the next generation. We shouldn't get quiet when we get older. We, 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 shouldn't, we shouldn't be just playing bingo somewhere. We need to be engaging with the younger generation. This is why we've kind of taken the age limits off a lot of our social activity groups. Generations means generations now. Mark, you can be a part. You're young enough. You're old enough. You just fit. I mean, we had so much fun last night beating each other. Not beating each other, but trying to beat each other in games. We had fun. There was laughter. There was enjoyment. There was conversation. There was builders talking about building things. And I kind of halfway listened. And, and I, I learned some things. And, and then there was, you know, there's people talking about different things. And I thought, look at all the wisdom in this room. How many of those young couples out there that are getting ready to build a house need to sit next to Larry and Bill when they're talking about building? When they're talking about home prices, when they're talking about how much per square foot. How many, how many of our young family life really could have used some of that conversation? We've got a mix. I understand going into different groups to learn specific things for different points of time in your life, for different seasons. But man, don't miss the generations above you and below you because every one of them has something for us and, and everybody's history with God is valuable whether it's a new history or an old history it's important God started dealing with me and I haven't done it yet I plan to start tomorrow keeping a journal and keeping a book for the next pastor of RCC I think man if my dad of course I was privileged Julie to get to be here from the beginning, from 1977, and to get to watch, but how much of that wisdom did I miss because it's not written down? So I'm going to start writing down what I can remember of his wisdom and start quizzing him some when I'm over there at the house with him and start writing it down and then writing down my thoughts. You know, this is how you handle a board. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. <laughs> I will be at work tomorrow. You know, this, this is how you do, you know, just wisdom on things that you don't run into until you're in the position as pastor. And, and things that nobody tells you. And, and just start making a list because your history is valuable to the next generation and it can save them a lot of trouble. So I love Psalm 102 with that thought in mind, verse 18. It says, write down for the coming generation what the Lord has done 
so that people not yet born will praise him. Isn't that good? I thought back to Regala. And one time we were, at least I think you might have been with me, we were in Branson and, and Regala was on the trip with us and Dylan's mom and Rachel's mom. And she talked to us about keeping a victory journal. And I thought, man, I wonder where that is. I wonder if those kids have that. And then I thought, your kids don't. My kids don't. How are the children that are not yet born going to know the miraculous things that I have seen if we do not write them down? Good project for us, right? Everybody be going buying a journal tomorrow. I love that. Your history is important to generations to come, even the children not yet born. Praise God. Let's, let's mix in with these young people. Let's invest our time, our history in them, and let them teach us something. I guarantee you Karen and Marilyn could write a book on what those kids upstairs have taught them. Some of them quite funny, I'm sure, but it's important. And so let's go over, let's love on these kids, let's invest in their lives. And even if you didn't, if you do not need to give to their mission trip, do not. If the Lord hadn't told you to and you don't need to, do not. But do go over. And just your presence there is an investment in them. It says, you know what? These adults care. And we do, don't we? Y'all can stand. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.